Um, okay, so thank you for inviting me here today to join this conference. Um, it's a real pleasure to be amongst those who consider light to be a subject worth such a discussion and such an incredible exhibition. Um, my thinking around the topic, the polit politics of light, has come from research conducted for my book, The Library of Light, published in 2019 by Lund Humphreys. In the section Political Light, I first began to explore light as a political medium. And I was really happy to contribute the essay to um, the book for this exhibition. And continuing on from that essay, I am continuing to work in this field and hopefully there will be a new book um, coming out in the next couple of years. I'm very grateful to Andreas and Holger for the opportunity to participate. And um, I hope that uh, uh, you'll bear with me presenting in English. Um, I've enjoyed the presentations visually so far, and it's very frustrating not to be able to engage in the discussion as my language skills in German are very poor. Um, so this was my book. I'll begin with this image of Robert Smithson's only work in light titled The Eliminator, um, which was created in 1966 when he was articulating his ideas about entropy. In his essay, Entropy and the New Monuments, Smithson considered energy to be something more easily lost than obtained. He spoke of the ultimate future in which the whole universe will burn out and be transformed into an all-encompassing sameness. He cited in this work the Northeast blackout of 1965 as a preview of such a future. Yet he also observed that the power failure created a mood of euphoria rather than dread. In Smithson's word, I quote, an almost cosmic joy swept over all the darkened cities. Why people felt that way may never be answered. The Eliminator used row upon row of neon tubes formed into lightning bolt shapes and reflected in mirrors to flood the vision of the viewer. With this work, Smithson attempted to overwhelm the eye with electromagnetic energy, a process he referred to as exhaustion of sight. This materialized Smithson's idea to put an end to conventional art viewing and instead introduce a kind of torpor, which Smithson described as the elimination of both time and vision. And now some decades after Smithson's predictions, our planetary situation is defined by the disintegration set in motion by humans. And while science and technology are advancing at a meteoric pace, we seem paralyzed in our efforts to address this. So why has light become a, a politicized medium? And I think maybe this is a discussion for all of us to have. Mark Titchener's work, The Only Language is Light, somehow speaks to this. The text refers to Brian Geissen's brain-stimulating dream machine and his idea of language being inseparable from the material of the universe. I might argue that since our perception is stimulated and altered by light, this biological imperative has been used in all kinds of ways to assert control over lifestyle. From mastery over human sleep to increasing the length of a day, all these things are efforts to impose production and efficiency on the human body. Whether this aim is to create sleepless soldiers, sleepless workers, and round-the-clock consumers, the common goal is the same, boosting productivity. There are many artists who work, explore themes of energy, electromagnetism, and electricity, and through their work, reflect upon and capture the vibration of our time. There is no doubt that the question of energy is becoming central now. During the 1990s, a Russian-European space consortium of scientists and engineers planned to build and launch satellites into orbit to reflect sunlight back to Earth. The device was called Znamya, and its purpose was to test a prolonged and controlled new light experiment. Acting like a giant mirror, it was intended to lengthen daylight hours, provide solar energy for power, 
and possibly one day power spaceships. Placed in sun-synchronized orbits, each satellite was to be equipped with reflectors of paper-thin material. Each mirror satellite would have the capacity to illuminate a 10 square mile area on Earth with a brightness nearly 100 times greater than moonlight. Russian scientists hoped to harness the sun's light as a cheap way of illuminating Arctic cities in the permanent night of winter. Whilst the initial plan was to provide illumination in remote geographical areas with long polar nights, allowing outdoor work to proceed around the clock, the plan was expanded to include the nighttime supply of lighting for entire cities with the slogan, daylight all night long. There was great opposition, including from astronomers who could see the catastrophic consequences for most Earth-based space observation. There were also scientists and environmentalists who expressed their dismay at the physiological damage for animals and humans from the loss of day and night. Cultural groups protested that the night skies are commons to which all of humanity is entitled to have access and that no corporation should be allowed to control or nullify this experience. A familiar image, no doubt. Whilst this extreme illumination experiment didn't get off the ground, we now have 24 seven global markets and infrastructure and large parts of the world's population in cities are continuously affected by high intensity illumination. Brightness and visibility is a signifier of political power, and yet domination of the city through light reveals the extent of corporate power and a deeply entrenched fear of invisibility and the dark. In his light installation, Culture Equals Capital, from 2016, the Chilean-born artist Alfredo Diar uses his equation to mark culture as the true capital of societies, placing value on ideas rather than economic interests. Diar's work is a reference to Joseph Boyce Kunst Equals Capital from 1979, equating individual creativity and art as capital and therefore as society's potential. Gustav Metzger's art is predominantly involved with attacking the system of capitalism, also the systems of war, the warmongers, and destroying them symbolically. Through this work, Metzger drew attention to the dangers through his work, not this work, Gustav drew attention to the dangers of extinction and the multiple betrayals that humankind has visited on nature. Liquid Crystal Environment is an extraordinary installation made of light and liquid crystal, which evolved over five decades, producing a limitless change of images. This work is an example of one of his objectives to create works that grow in volume and extend by reproduction. Metzger became preoccupied with growth as opposed to degradation, and his Liquid Crystal Environment is an example of his auto-creative art which aimed to use light and harness technology to engineer positive change. It is said that we are now living in the LED epoch and with the latest illumination technology comes brighter displays, higher resolution, bigger screens, more motion and a vast increase in LEDs. It is within our cities and with the increasingly bright lighting where we see convergence of psychology and capitalism. The effect is literally sensational, an assault on our senses and perceptual faculties. This trend in ramping up the sensory experience across the urban environment leads us to question the value of being in a newly sentient world. We might think of the tendency for overstimulation from media displays in the way French philosopher Paul Virilio theorized that we begin to associate the intensive kind of artificial light of mediated environments with weapons. And so we begin to think of the weaponization of light. For the month of March, Yoko Ono has staged a new global intervention by pausing the commercial advertisements on the world's prominent digital screens 
to share local translations of her message, inviting the world to unite efforts to bring about world peace. So maybe this is an example where scale and prominence are used advantageously in respect of humanity. If we look back through history, the weaponization of light began with blinding lanterns used by poachers in the 17th century, their dazzling and trapping effect, enabling murderers to hunt humans like animals or fish, to hold them at bay, to capture and to kill them. An example is seen in the executions by Francisco de Goya to commemorate the Spanish resistance to Napoleon's army. Powerful light rays are projected from a lantern onto the massacre victims, ensuring their visibility by the firing squad. It is a starkly cinematic staging of death created so we may bear witness to the brutality. At the time, dramatic light and shadows were used in painting as religious metaphors. In the 3rd of May, the traditional spiritual role of light in art has been subverted. From blinding lanterns, we continue through history to the use of high intensity light used to overstimulate the brain, a technique used by the military and weaponeers since the Second World War. Searchlights have had political significance since their cultural exploitation by Albert Speer for the Nuremberg rallies. And in recent years, artists have incorporated them as powerful sources of illumination into their artworks and especially for activating public spaces. One such example is Border Tuna, a large scale participatory art installation by Mexican Canadian artist, Rafael Lozano Hema. He used searchlights to make bridges of light that open live sound channels for communicating across the US-Mexico border. The piece creates a fluid canopy of light that can be modified by visitors in El Paso and in Juarez. This encouraged residents on each side of the, the border, the US-Mexico border, to communicate and listen to each other. Lozano Hemmer initially imagined Border Tuna as a light show, similar to the previous ones he'd been commissioned to create for the Olympics and for cities around the world. After giving it more thought, he decided that it shouldn't be a spectacle. Instead, he planned to use searchlights to create a project about intimacy and connection, to put the control in the hands of the participating communities. His aim was to create an alternative narrative to the one of the border wall, replacing it instead with a world of coexistence, interdependence, and a world where community brings together people in a way that is a beautiful example for the rest of the world. Gary Hill's work, Searchlight, sets up a different spectator relationship, bringing what is ordinarily an instrument of the skies into an interior gallery setting to consider its use as a cinematic technology of perception. In a dark room, a faintly lit instrument stands on a tripod, scanning back and forth in a slow movement. Hill's performing device scans the horizon line between the ocean and the sky, projecting its sight in a moment of rest onto the gallery wall. The movement expresses its function as both telescope and searchlight, appearing to conduct its operations of surveying, tracking and targeting. The searchlight replaces our vision like the sight on the barrel of an instrument in a reconnaissance mission, mobilizing and mechanizing the movement of the eye itself. And so, with a forensic gaze, we see what the machine sees, with not only a military, but an ecological perspective, in this case, unifying the natural and the human made. A modern development of blinding lanterns and searchlights is found in dazzle weapons, one of the many applications of powerful light sources that send the optical nerve into overdrive through extreme stimulus to the retina, blinding the enemy into submission. 
Paul Virilio's analysis of military ways of seeing claims that the function of the weapon is the function of the eye. Virilio aligned perception and destruction through the invention of laser weaponry and its first intended application to blind the human eye. Laser sights have long been available as a visual aid to the aiming of firearms, a beam or spot visible to the naked eye or night vision device. A range of laser dazzlers designed to disrupt infrared sensors and assail the human eye are thus in service today. The weaponization of light is also a well-known component in science fiction. From the earliest literary precedents of Isaac Asimov's force blade in his Lucky Star series of the 50s, to the laser swords of Star Wars and laser pistols of Star Trek, to the heat ray super weapons used by invading Martians in the film The War of the Worlds, directed by Steven Spielberg. The descriptive and physical qualities of light associated with popular culture have been assimilated into the war machine. It is the potential of the laser as a directed energy weapon that echoes the death ray of science fiction and continues to preoccupy the military. In Michael Light's photographic series, 100 Sons from 2003, the viewer assumes the role of an eyewitness, scrutinizing the visual evidence of America's A-bomb tests. Light selected 100 photographs of the nuclear detonations in Nevada and the Pacific Ocean between 1945 to 1962. The images were selected from a military archive originally shot by film directors, cameramen and stills photographers from the Lookout Mountain Air Force Station based in Hollywood, California. It is profoundly disturbing that the spectacle of war and its weapons of mass destruction can produce such dumbfounding beautiful images, which are almost comparable with natural phenomena. Gamma rays are visualized in se sensational and spectacular moments of complete annihilation. This photographic series is evidence of one of civilization's greatest tool-bearing moments, how humans learned to ignite their own star and become architects of our own sublime. Until 1952, the sublime was the province of the divine or of things that were bigger than ourselves. Everything shifted and you can look at that moment in different ways. It can be used as a major marker for the Anthropocene. Light's Hundred Suns literally exposes and keeps alive in the public consciousness the whole operation of weapons testing. But now that this weapons testing has shifted underground, there's no visual record to inform citizens of what its government is doing. So now there is cultural invisibility and secrecy. Robin Bell's approach to working with projected light is for maximum visibility. He uses light to illuminate struggles, problems, literally shining a light on an issue using light to make a conversation possible. Bell's guerrilla approach uses light fleetingly and literally to illuminate and engage the public in the current political issues. With high power projectors installed on a specially equipped van, Bell projects factual statements and commentary directly onto buildings related to the message. These site-specific works are often injected with humor to bring a sense of hope to difficult issues. Constrained by the policing of public space, the projections often only appear for 10 to 15 minutes. His work initially raised question, questions about whether the projection was a case of light trespass and whether it could be considered a criminal offense. When the light trespass law in the US was originally passed, it was well before any knowledge of atoms, electrons or photons, or of the concept of light as invasive in the way that we know it today. It was suggested that Bell's projected beam of light is used to intentionally invade property, but of course it was proved not to be illegal. Bell's concerns at the time were if new laws are introduced to prevent the invasion of these new light sources onto buildings, 
then this could constitute another path to restricting freedom of speech. Electricity and power, social control and surveillance are the subjects of Ivan Navarro's socio-politically charged sculptures of neon and fluorescent light. Born in Santiago, Chile in 1972 and growing up under General Pinochet's brutal military dictatorship, Navarro chose electricity as his subject since this was one of the tools used by Pinochet to dominate society and torture his victims. Pinochet regularly orchestrated power outages to ensure compliance amongst the general population. According to testimonials from victims, he employed electricity and light in more extreme methods of torture and interrogation sessions. There are testimonials of survivors enduring electric shocks, as well as the use of light and darkness for torture from being kept in kept in total darkness for alternating days and then in, under intense fluorescent lights. Coupled with his childhood memory of light, Navarro manufactures his works from the glowing reflective materials of fluorescent neon mirror to make the words repeat endlessly in order to have a confrontation of meaning. Navarro states, of course, I'm interested in social and political issues and how art can be a response that permeates everyday life. And I mean outside the context of an art institution. I believe in art that is a genuine response to human activities. For example, for me, any survival strategy, ingenious, inventive, resourcefulness is in itself a form of art. That is my deepest source of inspiration. Art is a way to subvert reality and that can take you in different directions, whether escapism, confrontation or both. Many of his works present light and electricity as a force that asserts freedom and energy among citizens, a strike against the use of light to dehumanize. In the shifting political realities and the post-truth era, the Paris-based feminist conceptual artist collective Claire Fontaine undermines the rules of a political game completely disengaged from questions of truth or knowledge. Foreigners Everywhere is a series of neon signs, which are announcements made in different languages, actively engaging the viewer in a dual meaning. Of course, the meaning changes depending on where it is situated. Whatever the context, it evokes the isolation of being lonely, speechless inhabitants of big cities, the reality of being foreign or stateless in a global society. Being confronted with this glowing neon is a mood deepening experience, liberating the viewer from being a passive observer and inviting their involvement in, in the aesthetic process towards a kind of society. Just a couple more examples now. Um, this work that we can see downstairs in the exhibition, um, I think is a very important one uh, for this topic. The concept of statelessness was first outlined by Hannah Arendt, a stateless refugee herself for 18 years after fleeing Nazi Germany. In her 1951 book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, Arendt describes the various groups of uprooted persons who had lost the pr protection and representation of their nation state and who exist in a nowhere place. This concept is embodied within white torture which in a blatant disregard of human rights, aims to destroy a person's psyche without leaving any visible traces. This form of psychological torture includes extreme sensory deprivation and isolation, enclosing the prisoner in a completely white soundproofed room with constant shadowless lighting to ensure sleep deprivation. The artist Grigor Schneider deconstructed this most horrific concept in his exhibition of the same name. Working from downloaded images of US detention camp five at Guantanamo Bay Naval Base, Schneider created an architecture of maze-like soundproofed spaces resembling interrogation rooms and cells, antiseptic spaces designed to break the subject's protective shields while leaving no visible marks. Schneider's installation exists as an authoritarian architecture where detainees are in limbo 
purgatory, isolation, suspended from society to become nowhere men. As viewers of white torture, this fictionalized nightmare becomes our reality and suffused through this architecture with tyranny, hierarchy, morality and power, we are faced with the radical evil of this world. Light a match and watch till it goes out. Yoko Ono's lighting piece grew out of her oversensitivity to sound and light and a personal ritual to calm herself. One day in 1955, she discovered that lighting a match and watching the flame extinguish seemed to give her an amount of relief. She repeated it, sometimes in front of her sister, until she became calm. Although it was a visual experience, the act somehow also had an oral effect in that the sounds in her mind disappeared as the light went out. In addition, watching the match flame made her compare its short life to that of humans, which made her feel serene. When she realized the effect of this action, she wrote it out as an instruction. Lights More Light is one of a series of works made by the artist Mark Titchener from Famous People's Last Words. According to Titchener, it represents the point of transcendence. On his deathbed, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe asked for more light. His last words express a perfect metaphor, a final plea for illumination in the face of humanity's extinction. I was going to end the presentation there, but um, I just wanted to end with a couple of slides. Um, more recent research um, is really around the subject of daylight. And, and I think this came up yesterday, although I couldn't keep up with the um, discussion. Um, and so I've just put in this slide, um, a great inspiration to me really, Nancy Holt, um, one of the, land artists. This is Sun Tunnels from 1973 to 76. Um, and say a few words about it. Um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with her work. Um, in a remote valley of Utah's Great Basin Desert, Holt's massive sun tunnels looms along the horizon, visible from over a mile away. The four concrete structures are arranged in a cross formation positioned precisely to frame the sun as it rises and sets during the summer and winter solstices. On those days, the sun is centered through the tunnels and is nearly center for about 10 days before and after the solstices. Small holes are configured in the concrete to cast projections of constellations along the tunnel's interior, their patterns illuminated upon the viewer inside. With sun tunnels, Holt brings the cosmos down to the earth and into the realm of human experience. And so um, finally, I just wanted to end um, with images of an early London Fieldworks project from 2001 to two. Um, this, in, we conducted uh, a month long period of field work in Northeast Greenland um, and it was a place fairly remote so we had to sort of pose as a scientific party to go there and in fact the we over a month we recorded um, light so the 24-hour daylight as it made its journey and sort of winter transition to polar night um, and simultaneously we made physiological recordings and the the idea the question at the time was can you transmit an experience of place, you know, can you capture, is it enough to capture this light and the human experience of this light and can it be recreated? And so it was very much a controlled experiment. We used spectroradiometers um, and biomonitoring equipment and brought back all this data to create this virtual daylight installation, which could then be triggered by uh, members of the public visiting the work. Um, I think this is 
this is a subject which I hope will be um, for future collaboration. Um, and I think daylight, natural light, is something that's worth much further discussion and research and to raise the stakes really for solar power and its potential benefits to humanity. So for me, this is very much an ethical post fossil response to the energy challenges we face right now. And I think it's important for us to start to consider a future where our reliance on power is not only reduced, but completely reconsidered. And this really seems paramount to me. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, no, keep it up. So, we will try. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, thank you, Jo. It was really very touching and um, interesting how you found, um, in a way, the way from all this kind of brutal um, phenomenon or um, light as a weapon, then to this poetic situation, which really touches. And I think you're right to say, let's um, explore natural light much more and be sensitive to it and observe it, understand it. Um, because then I think we also learn about um, br brutal um, sides of light. And in this, uh, in this uh, or under this frame, I would like to ask you again, about the installation you showed of the Mexican artist at the border um, between Mexico and uh, the US, where I think these light sources never can be peaceful. I mean, <laughs> yes, uh, one, f yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. N before it went to the sky, and we know the, um, the Albert Speer light domes, and here he says it's um, creating bridges, but to me it always tries to go to the infinity, and that is something that shows mainly power. I don't know if you feel the same about that. I do. I, I think that where searchlights are used, I think it's impossible not to make the connection to the past. And maybe if you're very young and you don't have this reference, you know, I mean, not not my age, young, um, young people, if they don't have the, the, the reference to war and the sort of architecture of light in that sense that was used as, um, yeah, rallying people for war. Um, it's, for me, spectacle and, and war are very aligned because it's, you know, you, you, it's a powerful tool. Um, and so I, I can't see it as a, uh, for me, there's too much reference to perhaps even, you know, searchlights on borders, whether it's, you know, at the point of the Berlin Wall, you know, in the past, you know, for me, there's, there's all those connections. So it doesn't particularly work as a, as a peaceful representation, not for me. But I think that's, that's the discussion. If artists are going to use some of these um, expressions, then they need to think quite hard about why, why they're using it and what they're actually saying. Yes, good morning. Thank you also for your wonderful article I read with a lot of information. But but the last point I wouldn't accept. I think to to um, tell these uh, these uh, young artists are young, they don't have the reference, and maybe for them it is a peaceful light because they do not know Albert Speer. I think this is, um, we, we can't accept this because the material and, and the history is there, so they have to... Um, also, they have to, to have this in mind. Well, Rafael, uh, Rafael Lozano Hemmer is not a particularly young artist, so I don't, I'm not saying that about his work. I'm saying if you were now 
you know, like my son's age, 13, and he was mm -hmm. starting to make some work and he didn't have the reference, which would be very poor, I, I accept, then maybe there's a, there's a reason why you might use a searchlight to do something. But for, for any artist working now, I, I agree. I don't, think, I don't think they could do it unknowingly. But maybe I am uh, allowed to pose another question. Um, do you see a development in the military use of light from these early things by searching light and, and lightning uh, structures like, like airplanes in the sky or in the submarine and uh, the works you showed by more individual um, or targeting an individual uh, like blending or things. Uh, is there a development in the use of light? You mean in the military? Yes. Well, yes. I mean, the, they're not supposed to use lasers to burn people to pieces, but that's a possibility because the, the more powerful the laser, that essentially burns through clothes and skin. And so mm -hmm. it's just a case of power. The more power mm. a laser can can totally take a missile out of the sky and it can totally take apart a human being so the development is in the power from what i can see and the you know the weaponization of it and it escalates but there is there are laws in place where they they're not supposed to develop it to that extent mm. I am, please. You can hear me? Yes. You showed us the um, example of uh, projection on the Trump Hotel um, and raised the question if this could harm property in a way. And it's, of course, connected to the issue of. Uh, Freedom of, freedom of speech. So do you know anything about um, if this was ever brought to court, this question, or is, if there um, anybody was sentenced, or um, do you have some more information about this question? Well, um, Robin Bell and his crew of artists and technicians, they were... Um, there were attempted arrests a number of times. In fact, a lot of the equipment was um, taken away. Um, and so their work was disrupted on many, many occasions. And I believe that the case did come to court about light trespass, but it was thrown out of court. Yeah. yeah okay. Because I think the whole thing was that the light, unlike sound that can penetrate into a building, the light you couldn't see inside the building it's only on the surface. So the case of light trespass, it, it couldn't go beyond the mm. stone. Mm. So they just couldn't make the case for it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so adding to that, would you say that um, light allows um, uh, a, a sort of activism in public spaces? Or could it be for future artists uh, and um, collectives to be a way to sort of trick the system with activism? Yeah, I mean, obviously Robin Bell has probably had the most experience of doing this um, in Washington, D.C. So um, that's a very kind of active and, and sort of debate in that area um, because, of course, it could only exist. His projection would last for a fraction of time, um, but he used it to, to, you know, put on all his social media so that so that it had a longevity um, for his message, which was only fleeting in real time. So I think it's it's a difficult space for artists to work with because you're going to get shut down very quickly. Um, so unless you've you've been commissioned to make something or you're Yoko Ono and you have a uh, you know, billboards around the world that you can activate. Um, of course, Jenny Holzer, you know, took over all those advertising spaces in the past. So 
um, I think it's hard to make those unannounced kind of guerrilla actions. But yeah, why not? I would like to add something because I had some experiences in Germany to do three political projections in Berlin. Mm. And basically, we're really chilled off here. So you just can do it. It's not illegal. <laughs> and you just have to run. So when I did the first time, I didn't know if I end up in jail, which didn't happen. They just blocked my material. Okay. And But the next thing is the images you produce. This is the question where they go. And in one project, the internet was cleaned up of it. So this is like interesting how um, the media flow works in society yeah. so it's not only the act of doing it because if you make it as you, you if you would do it it's like yeah. nobody would see it on site but it's the idea to go public with it in our media society yeah yeah, yeah i think it's a challenging environment um what's 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 your name what's your name i'm interested to see your work In ingo bracke yeah. And the, the work was, um, it, there were three political things. One was for uh, direct democracy for a political um, group. And the other was for the energy change. And there was a big discussion about um, the, um, uh, like, the, and, and the, well, it was against lobbyism of big energy companies. And in this particular uh, project, you really could see that they have so much power that afterwards, public appearance is cleaned up in the internet, which I couldn't believe before. I think it's a, a place that can stimulate public debate because I think, you know, we don't get taken seriously for protesting or marching or, you know, so in a sense, the words, you know, the clarity of the words that maybe you use, you can get a message across very simply um, just with a few words. And I think that's very helpful. And certainly that was Robin Bell's um approach you know he worked in sort of the field of graphic design so he used the simplest language he could uh, to be as effective as possible so yeah so uh, looking on the time maybe we continue with our next speaker thank you again thank Joe. you thank you and please accept <laughs> the presentation. Thank you.